All right, welcome to Sunday night service. And on our Sunday nights, we do four psalms in a row, four weeks of, of psalms, and then a week that's a little bit different. Uh, we'll either have a, a singing night or a Q&A. Tonight's a Q&A. And uh, it was also scheduled to be a Q&A for students. So we have a special treat. The students are with us this evening. And uh, the students significantly have populated the question list. So they got out ahead a little bit and gave us a lot of fun questions. Hopefully they, they have asked the questions that are on your hearts. And uh, so we're going to dig into those tonight. Uh, we have the opportunity to have Jake here with us tonight, who is the pastor elder over student ministries. And so, um, Jake, I just want to ask you at the front end, as you think about student ministries, you think about having uh, students in the ministry for a year or four years or six years, however much time you get with them, uh, if you could boil down the thing they need to leave student ministries with, what would you say that is? Jesus. They, uh, as I think of the privilege of uh, really working alongside parents, I say it every week in the email I send you. We take seriously the job, the, uh, the delegated task to help you evangelize and disciple your students. And uh, the verse that, that I would say overrides me and my, my goal there is, is Paul in Colossians. When he, he said in Colossians 1.28, he spoke of his ministry. He said, him, meaning Jesus, we proclaim, warning everyone and teaching everyone with all wisdom so that we may present everyone mature in Christ. For this I toil, struggling with all the energy that he powerfully works within me. So fundamentally, the students need to leave student ministries knowing Christ and maturing in Christ, which means that they need to know the gospel, the, the good news. Uh, the good news that Jesus, God himself, came to earth to die in the place of, of all who would believe in him. So they don't need primarily to learn how to be better people, how to fit in with church culture. They don't need to learn Bible stories. What, what they need to do is they need to come face to face with a holy God, where any view of themselves measuring up, and this goes for every person here, any any chance where you have, hey, maybe I'll be religious enough. Maybe I'll be good enough. Or you know what? I'm better than, than most of the kids at my school. When you come face to face with the holy God, you're never going to think, yeah, I think I'll be all right when I face him as judge. You're going to say, woe is me. I need a savior. And so I, every student, really every person in this church, every, every person needs to know when you've come face to face with God, you need a savior because you, me, every single person who's ever lived has sinned against God. And it is not a divine overreaction or a cosmic overreaction to say that my sin against God actually deserves hell. And so I want every student to know that holy God and then to see Jesus on the cross and say, that is my Savior. All of the, the wrath that I deserve was poured out on Christ. And I, and, and I want them to turn to him in faith. That's the only way in which we can have Christ's righteousness on us and our sin removed from us and is placed on him, not by being religious, not by going to church, going to student ministries, calling yourself a Christian, but despairing of yourself and turning to him and him alone for forgiveness of sins. So fundamentally, I, I want every student to come face to face with God, face to face with Christ, and then when they're saved to actually mature in Christ. God saves us to be formed into his image. So first and most, believe the gospel. Secondly, be matured into who God saved you to be. And that's, that's why we started this year 
saying, how do you study God's word? First, start with worship. Who is this God? And what should our response be? Worship. And uh, secondly, where do we see this God revealed most clearly? And that, that is in his word. So we're establishing for students regular patterns of Bible reading. There's a Q&A box in student ministries. Is it a physical box? It is a physical box that says Q&A on it. Okay. So students can fill out a question, drop it in the box. And uh, are these anonymous or do they sign them? We have had both, but most of the time they're anonymous. Can I read the names attached? No, their names <laughs> no, aren't we, attached. I anonymize them in the database. So my dad, whose name is, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Matt, you, you responded to that way too quickly. <laughs> All right. So uh, we bundled some of the first questions around Bible reading. And uh, here's question number one for you, Jake. I and my parents are following a suggested Bible reading plan. So students trying to establish good disciplines of Bible reading. Sometimes it goes better than others. Some days I miss my reading. What should I do the next day? Should I read two chapters? What if I miss two days in a row? Should I read three the next day? What if I get behind, I think is the question yeah. on that. So uh, this question comes because we, we actually encourage the students to read the Bible every day. And, and I know a number of you guys have, are doing that. And we, many of you have your own reading plans. We actually suggested one. And many families have jumped on board and are doing that together. Uh, my family does that. We individually read a chapter in the morning, and then we come together that evening and read it together. And so, so how, I'll, I'll answer it with how do I handle it? When, say that I miss my reading in the morning, uh, my goal is the next day would be to read both chapters because we're reading consecutively from beginning to end. That said, um, I can't tell you how many people, including myself, have fallen two, three, four chapters behind. And you, you just you say, man, it's going to take me so long to get caught up. I might as well not even read today. And so you start to stack failures and inevitably, that's usually how people fall off their Bible reading plan. And most of the time, it happens somewhere around Leviticus. So it, what I would encourage you to do is, if you miss one day, uh, read both the next day. If you miss two, just jump in on that day's reading going forward. An alternative would be just move your reading plan back. Just say, I'm, I'm going to ignore the days, and I'm just going to go one day, then the next then the next, then the next. The reason why I mentioned what my family does is I think there's a protection in that. And it, and it helps, it would be maybe an encouragement for you if you are trying to have family devotions, read the same thing in the morning, individual members of the family, and then come together that evening and read the same thing. Why that protects me is if I miss my reading in the morning, I know I'm gonna at least catch it up that night. Um, you know, th there's so many different ways to handle this. I, I think the main point is don't get caught up with, oh, no, I'm behind. The goal of your Bible reading is not to check the box. It's not to stay on top of the reading plan. It's to actually come face to face with the God of the word and to respond rightly to what you've read. So if you miss, just read. It doesn't totally matter what you read, but, but read. That's great. Uh, a similar question comes from a dad. I didn't know dads could put questions in the students' Q&A box. So I, well, I sent an email out to the parents saying, heads up, there will be a Q&A coming up. So if there's a question from your home, and so instead of sending me a question from the home, the dad sent me a question okay. of his own. It's a great question. A dad is asking, how do I lead my family better in regular Bible reading? I love this question because it means that dads are taking the responsibility to actually lead their home in Bible reading. Uh, just asking the question, if you are concerned about this, dad, that's a huge win in and of itself. It is right for you to lead your family in, just lead your family spiritually. And you're, the best way to do that is actually to read the Bible out loud with them and to help them apply it individually. Um, so how can you help your 
how can you lead your family better with God's word? My first answer is make sure that you're reading it yourself. Don't play leapfrog over yourself. You're going to have a hard time leading your family to a place that you haven't gone. That said, don't feel like, oh, I'm such a failure. I don't know what this means. I don't have a lesson. I don't know what to do. Therefore, I can't lead my family. Um, the best way to start, I'd say, is just to start. I'll tell you some of the things that I have done personally that are helpful. And I want Smed to actually jump in and, and do the same thing. Some things that I have done that have been helpful are read through a book that talks about the Bible, a, a devotional book that has Bible reading, um, and then stop, read the whole, whatever text that book has, read that together. I have done Look at the Book by John Piper, where every member of the family watched the video in the morning, and we all got together at night, and we read the passage, and we talked about what we read. What I'm doing right now is, like I said, we all read the same scripture in the morning, and then we read it and talk about it that night. Um, all of those are very, very different, but what each one of those does is it sets the expectation, Dad, me, I'm going to bring the family together, we're going to actually read, and it's uh, an overflow of what I have done personally. So I'd say more than anything, it doesn't matter what you do, just that you are doing it. And as you do it, remember the goal, just like in Bible reading, the goal isn't just get through the reading. But the goal is you have, you have souls, you have a family that you need to care for. Care for them with the word. Model for them how to, when, sin, when you see sin revealed, when you read it, confess the sin that God's word revealed in you. Confess it to them. When you see God uh, revealed in his word, lead the family in worship. Right? Don't, when God shows himself to be merciful, when God shows himself to be holy, when God shows himself to be wonderful and powerful and sovereign in his word, don't model for your kids, for your wife. Yep, that's what the Bible says, but model for them a worshipful, uh, repentant, a worshipful, um, uh, just a worshipful attitude that, that is actually responsive to the God revealed in the word. So, um, Smed, what, what about you? How do you answer that question? So, confession here. Um, there have been times where I open up the Bible with our family, and one of my kids asks a question that I never even thought of, and I don't know the answer to. And I have been intimidated at just reading the Bible with my kids verse by verse through a book. We've been hung up in places in the Gospel of John, because I don't know what to say. I didn't prepare a sermon. Um, that creates for me a paralysis of, oh, no, what, what am I going to do? And it, and it can create the opportunity to say, uh, it's just easier to not to. And I, I just want you to hear that from me. If you've ever felt as a dad, like, I didn't prepare. I don't know what to say. I don't know how to do a three-point outline for a passage or something like that. It's just important that your family recognize that it's important for us to open the Bible together. Just read. Do it. Just read. Just do it. Uh, you, you heard Jake say that already. There are many ways, lots of opportunities. When your kids are little, you're doing things different than when they're reading. Uh, you're doing things different than when they're teens. Life gets busy. Um, you just have to find a place to do it and make it as much of a pattern as you can. Um, don't get stuck in the paralysis of, I don't know how. Yeah. One of Just, the most helpful things that we did when my kids were younger, um, it's crazy how much of the Old Testament is dialogue. One of the funnest things that we did when they were young, I didn't mention this, was we would read and then I'd assign parts. You just look ahead. All right, you're, they're learning how to read. You're Abraham. You're Isaac. I'm going to be narrator. We read, and then at the end, we just say, what was the story? And what that does is it sets a, a habit in the home, even before they can truly understand. It sets a habit in the home of the normal thing for us is to open God's Word together. And what version of the Bible do you read at home, Jake? That changed over the years. Um, we read ESV. Um, 
when they were younger, it, it would be others. But but we read we read the the ESV because they're old enough. That, I guess this leads into the next the next question. Yeah. So a student asked the question, "Why are there so many Bible versions, and which one should I pick?" Uh, there's so many Bible versions because a version of the Bible is just a translation from the original language, which was Greek, Hebrew, Aramaic. Um, if you if you speak another language, you know if you hear somebody say something and, and they say, what did they say? There's, there's a number of different ways to say, to accurately reflect what was, what was said. Um, there, there's some versions that are very word for word, that seek to, to retain uh, the sentence structure, expose the actual words used. You can easily see repetition there. Um, they leave interpretive questions open for interpretation. Uh, there's others that, that are more thought for thought. So, so the, the word for word would be more like what we preach from, Legacy Standard or NASB. We have NASB on the wall out there. I, I choose ESV in our home. That's what I've memorized from. Um, then there's more thought for thought. And that's more like the NIV. And then there's more just paraphrase, like the message. I That's more in you're reading a commentary you're reading somebody's interpretation of what the text said rather than actually reading the bible so early uh we would read more of the the thought by thought uh tniv niv and at about as they became better readers we transitioned to the to the ESV, and the reason for that is because i've, I've taught them just as the students have learned i hope the students have told their parents about this the fish so you've, you've heard the story of Agassiz and the fish. Sit down and, and, and study your fish, right? There's, we shared a, a, it's a, a well-known story, but uh, of the importance of observing details. And just ask your kids about the fish. But observing details, and, and the word-for-word -word translation lets you see those details, the patterns, the therefores, the becauses, all the connections. It helps you see those better. So... Uh, we choose to to read in that in that version for that reason. Um, I would just encourage you to to pick one of something that they would aim towards more towards the word for word. Uh, probably not the Young's literal, which is so literal that it's almost unreadable. Um, Legacy is wonderful. NASB is great. ESV is is likewise. Likewise, good. If you're just picking from scratch, might as well pick the legacy because that way you're not having a hard time um, when Smed's preaching from up front. You're just, it's the version that they're hearing. And something that is actually a really helpful practice when you're studying God's word, if you don't speak the original languages, is, is to sometimes have two or three versions. Two versions is a good place to start. Um, do a compare contrast between the versions. It can help you see some things where the English might not perfectly reveal what the original language said and helps you ask questions you might not otherwise know how to ask. Do you have anything to add to that? Yeah, just uh, it's not a crisis of meaning. I'm not sure what's behind the question, but just because the NIV, the NASB, the ESV say something different um, does not create a crisis of can I trust my Bible? It's just a, a feature of translation. So generally, the English translations we use are really, really good. They're, they're trustworthy. If you're studying, this is where it's helpful to look at several different translations. Notice where they differ, and that's going to give you a clue at a good place to dig in, study the words, look at the grammar. Um, so reading big swaths, any of them are going to work. Studying details, use several, notice where they're different. That'll help you know how to dig a little bit. Yeah, the main thing is you can trust uh, your Bible. Uh, something that's wonderful, we have so many tools available to us with these translations where on the digital tools, you see me with my iPad, and, and, and something that's really helpful is on these, you can see the words behind the words. We have so much in the, in the way of tools today that, uh, that just the, the church has not had. And uh, so I would see this, we have so many different versions. You can get paralysis by analysis with that and say, I don't know what it means, and, and therefore you, you, just, you just freak out and, and you, 
you never come to a conclusion. Um, but view the, the, the different versions. The fact that you can have a legacy standard and an ESV and a Bible dictionary and these maps in your pocket or on your table, it is a huge, huge blessing. And, uh, and so I, I'm grateful that, that you're asking the question. Um, and if you want help on choosing deeper, if you ask that question or you need help uh, digging deeper with tools to help you understand how to get to the answer of those questions when you have two different versions differ a little bit, come talk to me, talk to Smed or one of the other pastors. Uh, Smed, I, there was a question that came in this last week. Uh, somebody said they read an imprecatory psalm. Uh, that's where David is asking God to judge his enemies and evildoers. And I, I taught the kids, when you read God's word, you're supposed to say, what does this reveal about God and how should this affect me? So they were having a hard time knowing how an imprecatory psalm should affect them, how they should apply that to their lives. Uh, can you dig into that a little yeah, bit? Yeah, I'm just impressed that a high schooler used the word imprecatory. Uh, it's wonderful. Okay, so an imprecation is when you're praying against somebody. An imprecatory psalm is when uh, David prays that God would destroy the enemies. Uh, does that go against love? Does that go against mercy? What, why are those in the Bible? Should I pray those prayers too? I mean, these are in the psalms. Should we be singing this? Down with our enemies. Uh, let me give you an example. Uh, psalm 510. You can uh, open your Bible there. This is a psalm of David, and he talks about the wickedness of wicked people. And in verse 10, he says, Hold them guilty, O God. By their own devices, let them fall. In the abundance of their transgressions, thrust them out, for they are rebellious against you. Uh, I don't know if that's a, a prayer you regularly pray. Uh, this is a prayer in the Bible, a, a prayer that David prays and, and ends up in the songbook for Israel. Um, I want to give you some categories for thinking of imprecation, particularly in the Psalms. For David, a personal crisis is also a national crisis. David is not personally offended here, and I can't believe this guy did this thing to me. God, destroy him, please. David is the king. He's the king over God's people, Israel. He's responsible for the well-being of the nation. And according to 2 Samuel 7, he's also the placeholder for God's covenant promises. In other words, Messiah would come through David's line. A threat to David personally becomes a threat to the Davidic line, a threat to the stability of the nation with David as king. His personal crisis immediately becomes a national crisis, becomes a covenantal crisis. And so it is right for David to pray that God would keep his promises protect the seed line through the Davidic promise of 2 Samuel 7, preserve the stability of the nation that he has promised to be the in covenant relationship with. That sort of takes the imprecations out of the realm of personal vindictiveness. I want to get back at this guy, and so I'm going to use my God as a curse, like a pin cushion and a doll. I'm going to stick this needle in the doll that I made of my friend, and God's going to get him. Right? That's not the idea of the imprecatory prayer. Uh, David is concerned about the glory of God and the reputation of God and his promises in those imprecations. It is also right, as we've been seeing in the book of Revelation, that even heaven would cry out and the martyrs and the saints would cry out, how long, O Lord, until you vindicate your own name and make everything right? I mean, in one sense, the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven, is a prayer that God would make all wrongs right. That means the wrongdoers are in big trouble. So it is right for the glory of God to ask that God would set things right. We just must never do that from a vindictive spirit, from a, a personal hurt that then removes us from the throne of grace where we're asking for God um, to, to be kind in the gospel to our enemies. What does Jesus say? Pray for your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you. You'll be like your Father in heaven. Um, there's, a, there's a rightness for us in that. So 
Um, the imprecatory prayers are, are in our Bible and they serve particular functions. Um, but I don't consider them models for praying against people that hurt me personally. So, yeah. go ahead. Uh, one of the students, as, as we were talking, remember we did observation, interpretation, application. And one of the things that, that we have on your note sheets in your binder, right, you, you say, what does the text say? And then what's the second question? What does this reveal about God? And it, while you might not, you ought not pray an imprecatory prayer against the kid at school who is mean to you, uh, you actually can know God does care about wrongs done. Uh, there will not be one wrong done, one sin committed that will not be avenged. And, and so when I read the imprecatory prayers, I can't help but think, like you said, of Matthew 5, 43, but also um, Romans 12, 19. It says, Beloved, never avenge yourself, but leave it to the wrath of God. So, so that, that desire in you, God, did you see what just happened? Sometimes it's a small, trivial thing where, where you can love your enemies, pray for those who persecute you so that you can be like your father in heaven. But you ought not say, ah, I'm going to, there is no role for justice. You just as a Christian say, uh, I can trust God to have justice served. So, so when you pray, my, my response to the imprecatory prayers is, God, I know that you saw that, and I know that justice will be had. Will, will you please work it so that that justice will be had on Christ on the cross and use me, if you would, to bring that person to repentance? That, that's our response when, when you see an enemy, when you have somebody, your adversary. Second Timothy, this is one of my favorite passages in all of Scripture because I have to preach it to myself. Second Timothy 22, uh, 24, and 25. The Lord's slave should be the kind of person that, that, that God would love to use to grant repentance to his enemies. Uh, it says, the Lord's slave must not be quarrelsome, must be kind, able to teach, correcting his opponents with gentleness, because God may perhaps grant them repentance. And so if your opponent, if the person who sinned against you, is granted repentance justice was still had. It was had on Christ on the cross. And if they refuse to repent, um, you, you can be the kind of person who says, God, I trust that you will make it right in the end. Uh, so when your enemy's hungry, give him something to eat. When he's thirsty, give him something to drink. Uh, leave it to the wrath of God. Vengeance is his. He will repay. Uh, so, Smed, um, there was a question sort of more, uh, it's been on a lot of people's minds. I'll, I'll read the question. It said, if Steve Lawson knew his Bible so well, and this was because I, I was talking about God's word is a means to know God and to live a holy life. He said, if Steve Lawson knew his Bible so well, how could he sin like he did? What would you say? It's a, it's a sobering question. Um, and it's sobering on several counts. We'll just start with it's not the Bible's fault. Right? If somebody knows their Bible well, how could this happen? Anytime somebody sins, uh, we are discovering how sinful sin is. And, and we're discovering in the life of an unbeliever how enslaving and terrible sin is, or in the life of a believer, the residual sin in a forgiven believer is awful. Uh, Steve Lawson, as you know, um, uh, recently defaulted, um, was involved in, in sin that permanently disqualifies him from pastoral ministry. Uh, we had his books on our bookshelves. Uh, we all heard his sermons, no doubt. He has preached at conferences that many of us have been to. 
And this is a man who's 73 years old, I believe. And, and it's, a, it's a sobering question to think that someone who's been a mentor to many, someone who has held on to sound doctrine, someone who's been a champion of the truth, someone who has preached sermon after sermon after sermon, who has believed the Word of God as true and has proclaimed strongly the Word of God as true, is that exposure not enough to keep somebody from falling morally, publicly? Uh, is the Word of God enough to keep me? I, I, I sense that's the, the heartbeat behind the question, and, and, and that heartbeat is so appropriate, we have to get personal. And I want to give a couple of just encouragements to us up front before, before we get to the meat of the question. Uh, one encouragement is, is just to remember not to sensationalize sin. It would be inappropriate for us to sort of scurry into all the details of some scandal. Those things go down like dainty morsels and become fuel for gossip and uh, unhelpful conversations. And you can get on the internet and start searching for lots of details. Let me encourage you to not do that. Uh, that doesn't serve our own hearts well. There are lessons for us to learn. And there is a burden of information that the elders caring for those situations must carry. Those are not our burdens. Our burdens are not to adjudicate the cases, figure out all the details, find out who was wrong and to what degree and all of those kinds of things. Those are not our burdens. Secondly, I think there's a lesson for us in not elevating to sort of celebrity status, servants of the word. You may remember in 1 Corinthians 1, Paul is indicting the Corinthian believers who were saying, oh, I'm of Paul, I'm of Apollos, I'm of Cephas, well, I'm of Jesus. And there's sort of one-upmanship over who their favorite preachers were. <coughs> there's a very real danger in the sort of weird Christian world that we're in to be entertained by servants of the word, where we remember the servant rather than the word or the author. Uh, we've sort of elevated people to speaker status. So they're my favorite because of the way they talk. That is a very real danger for our hearts. And it's a very real danger to the servants who make it their task to proclaim God's word. They don't want to be elevated that way. We don't want to elevate them that way. And that comes with all the risks inherent with a sort of celebrity Christian culture. We need to avoid that kind of thing. Um, a, a third sort of lesson in that for me is just the reality of, of Hebrews 13, 17, which is two sides of the coin for sheep and shepherds, but it is local shepherding ministry that is talked about there. Submit yourselves to your elders. They give account for your souls. Uh, the, the first half is for all of us as sheep in the church. The second half is really scary for the shepherds in a church who have to give account to God for the state of souls under their care. And what that means is shepherds, she, uh, shepherds shepherd sheep among them. Even in Acts 20, you have the command of the Ephesian elders from Paul, shepherd the sheep among you. In 1 Peter 5, same thing. This, the proximity is required. You don't have proximity to a YouTube preacher. You don't have proximity to a conference speaker to see his life, to, to see a consistency of life, to know his family, to, to see the word of God proclaimed publicly, lived out personally. That is a severe weakness to the sort of celebrity preaching culture or just getting your information from the word of God, not through the living vessels of shepherds accountable to you and accountable to God in your midst, but getting it from a distance, uh, through the internet, through the pipeline. There's no doubt that we benefit from sermons that were well-preached centuries ago that are in books, or if you're old enough to remember cassette tapes from John MacArthur, or now YouTube access to preaching from all over the world. Our missionaries benefit from live-streaming the services here. There's tremendous sharpening that can be had, but the Achilles heel in all of that is you've removed yourself from the accountability of shepherds in your church, and you've removed the shepherds, the speakers, from the accountability of you being in their lives. 
They, the, the, the shepherd's saying something funny, squirrely. They've mishandled the text, or their lives are inconsistent with what they proclaim. You get to come up and kick us in the shins. Say, Pastor, what are you doing? There's something really good about that in the local church that's missed in the, the distant shepherding. So with all that up front, uh, let me just help us think through, apply this to a Steve Lawson situation, or any favorite leader that fails in some public way, scandalous way, or disappointing way. Maybe it's a, a, a discipleship leader that just walks away. What, what should you be doing? What is your takeaway? I want you to turn to Romans chapter 6. In the case of this current situation, we're talking about somebody who we, we might have just assumed he's run his race, he's finished his course, he's passed on the baton, he's done, he, he did well, 73 years old, um, but there's a failure. This ought to press upon every one of our hearts the right kind of fear of self. You cannot coast in the Christian life. You cannot assume fidelity of faith or of morality. And I would just suggest to you, and there are many passages you could go to to press this, but I like Romans 6, 12, and 13. Romans 6, 12, and 13 says, Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its lusts, and do not go on presenting your members to sin as instruments of unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. I want to set the stage, and then I want to paint a picture of how to use these two verses. So this, this section on how to fight sin in the book of Romans, in Paul's explanation of the gospel, comes under the banner that we find at the end of Romans 5. We would call this the reign of grace, Romans 5.21. Just as surely as sin reigned, that's the verb form of king, sin was king, sin dominated, sin had the dominion, sin kinged in the realm of death, just as much as that was true, so now in the life of the believer, grace reigns. Grace dominates. Grace is king. Through righteousness, to eternal life, through Jesus Christ, our Lord. There's a whole bunch of words in there to unpack under the reign of grace. But what it means is you're no longer a slave to sin. You are now a slave to a new Lord, a new master, who doesn't want to kill you and destroy you and take everything precious from you, but a master who laid down his life in love for you and directs your life in love, for his glory, and for your good all the time. What a good master you have now compared to the evil overlord you served willingly before you were a Christian. Now in Christ, under the reign of grace, you died in reference to sin, you were raised to new life in Christ, and we get these commands. The first command comes in verse 11, consider to be true all the gospel truths. Just think about them. The very next command that comes is what I read to you in verse 12. Therefore, don't let sin king. Don't let it reign. Now, he's personifying your own sin, residual depravity. But Christian, he's telling you, you used to be a slave. Don't let that old slave master tell you what to do anymore. In fact, don't walk into the hall of that king's uh, throne room with your mortal body so that you obey his desires, its lusts, and don't go on presenting your members, that is, your eyes, your hands, your mind, your affections, your will, don't go present these elements of who you are into that throne room of that old slave master. And notice what Paul says. He says as instruments, the the word there is as weapons. Don't, Don't present your character, your your time, your opportunities, your body parts, your mind, as weapons of unrighteousness to that old slave master. What is he going to do with them? Hey, I showed up this morning. Remember how we used to have fun together? Uh, That was kind of fun, right? So here's my hands. Here's my eyes. Here's my feet. Just take them. What do you want to do with them? What do you think sin's going to do with those things? Go back to old ways and destroy everything that's precious to you. 
could take your life if it could. But instead, verse 13, present your whole selves to God as truly alive from the dead, since you are a Christian, and present all of your members, all of your faculties, all of your resources, as weapons of righteousness to God. Show up in God's throne room every day, between now and 73 years old, and say, my mind is yours. My hands are yours. My eyes are yours. You're going to need to do that in the morning. You're going to need to do that every morning, between now and 73 years old. You're going to need to you're going to need to do it again at 10.15. You're going to need to do it again at lunch. Pray it again. Whether this passage or another passage, you're going to need to do this again at coffee break at 2 in the afternoon or whatever it is, at segments during the day. Because this is a fight. It's an ongoing fight of faith and obedience that you cannot let up on. How does a Steve Lawson who knows his Bible so well end up failing so publicly, so devastatingly with such consequences. Um, The same way any of us would, any of us could, if you coast, if you let up, if you don't do the same old basic disciplines that you're being taught in student ministries, that you're taught in Build and Wellspring. Get up in the morning, bring yourself before God, listen to God and His Word, present yourself to Him, repeat, you just need, you need to stay close to him, and, and the stakes are high. It sounds like a lot to think, oh, I could never make it 73 years, or however much time you have left on this earth. You, you don't have to tomorrow. You don't, you don't have to go six decades tomorrow. What do you have to do tomorrow? Make it from the time you wake up until that 10 o'clock break when you open Romans 6 again, and then make it to lunch. That's what you need to do. It's a walk. Jake. That's so good. I remember a decade ago you saying, don't give the enemy your weapons. I've preached that to myself so many times. And he, Hebrews 12, you don't run this race by keeping your eyes on the race and saying it's a really long race. But as you run the race that's set before you, you keep your eyes on Christ. Um, yeah, that's, that's so good. Um, just don't, don't give up the fight. It is worth it every day to discipline yourself for the sake of godliness. It's, it's worth it. Jake, you were talking earlier about, uh, back to Bible reading and interpretation, observation, interpretation, application. Uh, I think you've been using that template with students to get at authorial intent. Yeah. There, there's one meaning in a text. We want to get God's meaning written through the human author. Um, how do we get that? Uh, a couple questions came in related to that. If everyone follows the same Bible, how do interpreters end up at different conclusions? How, how do pastors preach different sermons? How, how, how do we get to different interpretations? And, and related to that, um, there are commands in the Bible. Which ones do I follow? How do I know? So this is kind of a bundled up hermeneutics question. How do, how do I get single meaning from the text? How do I work to find it? I think the first and most fundamental thing is to recognize that there is a meaning and that the meaning is something that can be known. The the Bible was written by authors, uh, little a authors, inspired by the big A author, and they wrote in a specific historical context, cultural context, using words and phrases and sentences And they intended those words and phrases, sentences, to be understood. There's no mystical meaning that you need a code to unlock. Um, It is accessible. Uh, So the, the, the first thing is to actually believe that you can, you can do that. And part of it is you just have to, uh, I've said it to the kids, keep your bottom in the chair and keep looking at your fish. Keep looking at the text and say... All right, back up, Jake. You, now you're going to have to explain the fish. Just do it. Give us the illustration. All right, sorry. There's a scientist. He came in. He wanted to learn about insects. And his, his boss said, here's a fish to look at. And he looked at the fish for 15 minutes, thought he saw everything there was to see. And he came back and said, tell me about your fish. Uh, you didn't see it. 
day after day after day. And, and he learned the importance of sitting there and actually observing the details. You, you see the small things, you work from the small details up to the patterns, up to the big things. And we learned some lessons like uh, the, the discipline of persistence in observation. Uh, one of the things we learned was your pencil is your best eyes. It's, you can have mumbled, jumbled thoughts when you just think about what you're reading, but there's something clarifying. You can write yourself to clarity when you take notes. Uh, and you just do the work of sitting in, the, sitting in the chair with your eyes on the text, observing. And, and honestly, that is one of the most important first steps to answering any of this. How can you make sure that what you're reading is actually what's in the Bible? Read the Bible. Grow very, very, very familiar with the words on the page. And then you have to know that your task is not to read your own preferences, your own experiences. You don't ask, what does this mean to me? You ask, what does this mean? And then how does it affect me? And so when you ask, what does this mean? That means you're getting first the, the meaning outside of your own context. You're not thinking, what am I facing today? When you open God's word, you say, God, what did you mean to communicate when you wrote these words? Which means you have to get yourself out of today and back a couple thousand years. And you have to ask the question, who wrote this? What was the context in which it was written? Was this written to Christians? Or was this written to Israel? Or was this written to Noah? Uh, so that'll help answer the question, is this command for me? Um, so when you're reading the Old Testament, it, you, it's really important that you understand the historical context in which it's in, and, and you understand, okay, if this is a command, is this rooted in God's character? Is this a, a biblical principle? Do I see this repeated in the New Testament? If you do, uh, the Bible should interpret the Bible, and you should say, okay, yeah, that's something that flows from God's character. Like, don't commit adultery. Don't steal. Don't murder. But when you read something like, don't eat pigs, uh, you actually see that was rooted, or don't get tattoos, or don't wear certain types of clothes, or such and such. You see that was rooted in a particular historical context for a particular people who you are not. But it still reveals something about God. Um, so, so you basically it goes back to what we were talking about in our, in our lessons, where you need to say, what does the Bible mean? in its original context, to its original people. And honestly, most of the problems with where you get just, man, there is such a discrepancy in teaching. Somebody claims that a clearly anti-biblical teaching came from the Bible, and they have a verse to prove it. Almost always, they're reading something into the text, taking the text out of context, ignoring what they're not coming out of it, saying, let me explain to you what the original author meant to the original recipients, and that's how I get to this conclusion. Instead, they are focusing in on a narrow uh, section of scripture separated from the context and justifying uh, usually a preconceived desire in themselves. Uh, that's something that every one of us is capable of doing, and, and you actually need to know when you come to the text, you say, God, Help me pay attention here. Help me to understand this. And, and then you say, God, I want to make sure. You remember LUBOT. That's the acronym that we, we learn to pray before you read God's word. You, you say, God, help me listen and understand your word. And then respond rightly. And that's the bot. So LU is, is listen and understand. The bot is, God, let me believe, obey, and trust your word. You see that? Believe, obey, and trust puts you under the authority of God's word. Instead of coming to God's word and saying, let me wield my authority and my preferences and find a proof text to prove it, we come to God's word and say, God, show me what you actually said, what you actually meant by what you said, and then make me to submit to it. And back to the way we opened this, you will not submit to God's word. You will not understand it rightly apart from being saved from the heart. You have to have a renewed nature and you have to have the Holy Spirit's help in order to, uh, to respond to the word of God rightly. So, uh, Jake, a question came in about baptism. 
how, how do I know if I should get baptized related to that? How do I know if I'm a Christian? Uh, let me just give an advertisement and a plug uh, for students and parents to sign up for the baptism class. Uh, I don't remember offhand what Sunday it starts. Is it next week? Three weeks from now. November 3rd. What yeah. month are we in right now? October. October? Okay. So, uh, sign up. You can do that on the church website. You can stop by the info table. You can stop by the office. Uh, if you tell me, I'll forget. Um, but sign up for the baptism class. There we explore what is baptism, who is it for, when should one get baptized? And so it's a, a great place to sort of sort out those questions. Fundamentally, baptism is an external expression, an obedient expression of an internal change that the Holy Spirit brings about. Bottom line is, if you're a born-again believer, you should get baptized. Now, there are caveats to that for uh, testing genuineness of faith and and trials demonstrating a, a genuine faith, and we'll talk about all that in the baptism class. But um, if, if that's a question that you have, come to the class, and, and we'll talk about it with our Bibles open. Um, it's 7 o'clock. The students are now going to go to their discussion groups with their discussion group leaders. And so um, kids, students are excused. Student ministry staff, you guys are excused. We're officially dismissed it just turned 7 o'clock, but Ben has a roving mic. And if you want to stick around and ask some more questions off the cuff, you can do that. So, students are leaving. Sarah Shelbourne's raising her hand back there saying, I have a question. Ben's running back with the microphone. No, she's not. Okay. Okay, Carol Liu, Matthew Pruitt, their hands both went up. Both of you asked questions last time we did this, didn't you? Okay, go ahead, Carol. That's good. And then we'll go Carol, Matthew, Sarah. How do you self-examine pride and how do you call out pride in someone else in a humble manner? Um, I'm rubber, you're glue. Uh, I know you are, but what am I? Uh, that's a tough one. Um, pride, by its, by its very nature, is blinding. What is pride fundamentally? It is a, a high view of self. Uh, and a high view of self quickly exonerates self and indicts others. Uh, there's so many warnings against pride uh, in the scriptures. Um, I'm just open to Romans 12. Through the grace given to me, I say to each one among you, not to think more highly of himself than he ought to think, but to think so as to have sound thinking, as God has allotted to each a measure of faith. There's a prohibition of uh, against thinking more highly of yourself than you ought. Um, because that prohibition is there, if you have to help someone else see his or her pride, the very real possibility is that you'll be blinded to your own in the process. So your question, Carol, is insightful. Um, and, and you answered the question in your question. Do it humbly. What does it look like to help anybody see their sin uh, Galatians 6 gives the prescription for us. Galatians 6.1, it, it gives us sort of the how-to uh, and the attitude involved along with the self-examination required. And, and if we take this out of the realm of pride and we just apply this uh, to any sin, um, this is a, a really helpful passage. Galatians 6.1, brothers, if anyone is caught in any transgression, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness, each of you looking to yourself, so that you, not, you will not too be tempted. 
bear one another's burdens, so fulfill the law of Christ. If anyone thinks he has something when he's nothing, he deceives himself. So there's a, there's a whole lot in there related to your question. But first of all, if anyone is caught in any transgression, the idea is not I came around the corner and I caught you sinning, ha ha. The idea is you came around the corner and you saw your friend, your brother, your sister in Christ who is trapped, caught, snared by a sin that is debilitating, crippling. Uh, the image in my mind of, uh, of this word caught is, you know, those old cartoon bear, steel bear traps with the big teeth and they snap shut when you step on the plate. You imagine your friend walking through the woods and, and stepping into a, a steel bear trap and the bear trap snaps on the leg, compound fracture, blood. Your friend is on the trail just moaning in pain. They need help. Not, I'm better than you and I caught you, buddy. Uh, they need you to get in there, get your hands dirty, and pry apart that steel bear trap in love and with tenderness, bandage wounds and help. That requires a humility, a compassion. According to Galatians 6, it requires you looking to yourself, uh, restoring one in a spirit of gentleness so that you will not be tempted. Paul doesn't tell us tempted towards what? I think tempted towards anything. Tempted towards the same sin your brother got stuck in? Uh, tempted towards the air of superiority. You fell for that. I would never. Anything you could be tempted by, you must guard against. All of that requires a profound humility that comes from you who are spiritual. Uh, your, your best bet in some of those things is to grant your own potential blindness and have others help you. Uh, just don't trust yourself. You need others' eyes on your blind spots. Um, it's not easy. You, you do have the confidence knowing that God is the one who does his work in people. You and I can't be the Holy Spirit and actually bring about change. We can only be instruments prayerfully to be used in God's hands for his purposes. Um, God's opposed to the proud. He'll, he'll humble the proud. Um, the, the, the goal is not to level everybody that you think is proud. You, you'll be guilty of the pride right there. So, um, again, Carol, you answered the question in your question. Do it humbly. Matthew. Huh, okay. Are you ever going to do a, a, a quipping hour or like a late night on ideas and themes, specifically like uh, gold or Cyprus? Because I recently went through Nahum, and specifically Nahum chapter 2, uh, end of verse 3, and the cypress spears are brandished. I was trying to understand, like, uh, is there something behind cypress? And I was looking online, and I realized that, or what I found was that cypress trees are a symbol of everlasting life, and therefore, for the Babylonians to kill the Assyrians with cypress spears is a mockery in of itself. Okay, you know, I've never considered Cyprus spears through the hearts of Babylonians a theme for equipping hour. But now that you've said it, it's on the list somewhere. Uh, answer your question, Matthew. Um, any ideas that you have for equipping hour, feel free to email me, text me. Um, listen, going back to what Jake was saying about hermeneutics, the secret to understanding your Bible, being a good detective, is being a reader and an observer. Just keep reading. Sometimes we think the big mystery is finding the, the Greek word behind the word and the some, some secret grammar answer. Listen, there, there are things to be studied at the word level and the grammar level, but the biggest discoveries you will make in your Bible, and you will never exhaust your Bible in this, any translation, will be found in just your reading, slowing down, meditating and thinking about it. And, and because that's the case in this inexhaustible book in our lifetimes, uh, we'll be discovering stuff like cypress spears uh, and, and the significance of them for a lifetime. It's a great, great question. All right, Sarah had her hand up and then Jin Shah. She didn't? Okay. She retracted her really good question. Sarah Martin. Um, looking at Hebrews 13, 
um, early in the chapter, it's talking about sacrifices. And then it says in verse 15, referring to Jesus, through him then, let us continually offer up a sacrifice of praise to God. That is the fruit of lips that give thanks to his name and do not neglect doing good and sharing for with such sacrifices, God is pleased. I always kind of get hung up on the idea of praise being a sacrifice. And can you kind of bring a little bit of clarity to that. And then it also says doing good and sharing. So are there any other sacrifices that a believer should be making? Yeah, what a great question. Obviously, the book of Hebrews is building on the themes of the Old Testament sacrificial system. When it comes to substitution, Jesus is the once and for all time final sacrifice, blood sacrifice as substitute for sin. But there are, of course, other sacrifices in the Old Testament. Um, sacrifices of, of first fruits. There were wave offerings and grain offerings and thanksgiving offerings. Um, some of those ideas carry over into our day and what Christians should do. I can think of uh, three things that are called sacrifices in the New Testament, picking up on the language of the Old Testament. Two of them are here. One of them is in Romans 12.1. So uh, a sacrifice of praise, whereas we are bringing ourselves to God and we worship him. Uh, that, that is a sacrifice with which God is well pleased. And also in this context, um, you just alluded to it, uh, the, the sacrifice of doing good and sharing. God is pleased with these things. And I think both of these things, uh, offering God praises vertically and then horizontally serving others for the glory of God are seen as, we'll use the word cultic, worship practices. By cultic, I don't mean uh, the occult or you join some cult. That's just the, the technical word describing the outward, liturgical, sacrificial worship activities of the Old Testament. And in the New Testament, these things become uh, very organic. It's not like you show up at a certain time and do this thing a certain way. Uh, it, it's not built on the calendar or even holidays. It's just all the time, your life is a sacrifice. And that, that gets back to the other use of this word, which is Romans 12. Therefore, in view of the mercies of God, offer your bodies as sacrifices. Now, normally when you brought a sacrifice to the altar, you'd slit the throat and put the carcass up on the fire. But Romans 12 says, your bodies are a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. Lots of the same language of the Old Testament and as Hebrews 13, um, but the sacrifice is your whole self, living, walking, breathing, serving, loving up on the sacrificial altar of praise and worship to God for his glory. A soothing aroma to him, your life lived for him and for others. It's a great, great question. I don't know if it answered it. All right, Jin Shah. Okay. Um, can you please teach us what is the difference between um, dispensationalism and a covenant theory, and how are we affected by this two different theory? How do we discern the promise in the Bible? Okay, great question. Uh, what is dispensationalism, covenant theology? How does that relate to promises in the Bible? Labels are tough. Labels are just challenging. Um, if I said, I'm opposed to covenant theology, you might hear covenant and theology and say, well, theology is good. That's about God and covenants are in the Bible. I've read about them. How could anybody be opposed to covenant theology? Um, if you read John Calvin's Institutes and you said, I'm opposed to dispensationalism. I don't know any theological writer that used the word dispensation more than John Calvin. And, and it just creates confusion because these labels for theological systems have so much baggage. Generally speaking, covenant theology and dispensationalism are two different ways of organizing all that the Bible has to say in God's relationship to humans, God's relationship to the nation of Israel and to Christians today, and God's relationship to his covenant promises. Um, at, I'll, I'll use the labels since you asked the labels, and then we'll back away from the labels. Because I don't, I don't care if you 
call me or don't call me a dispensationalist. Um, that word is so loaded that it depends on who's asking. To, you know, if you ask me, are you a dispensational? I'm, not, I'm just not going to say yes or no. I'm going to say, what do you mean by that? Uh, because in, in some circles, dispensationalism means I don't believe in the lordship of Christ. I believe there are two ways or more of salvation. Um, I believe that the, the way to read prophetic sections of Scripture is to open up the newspaper headlines and match your Bible to whatever just happened in the Middle East. Uh, there, there's a whole bunch of caricatures uh, about dispensationalism. I'm just not going to answer that question, yes, until I know what are you asking. And if you ask the question, does God work with different people in his redemptive plan in different ways throughout history? Well, yes. If, if you call those dispensations, and you don't pin me down on how many you, you think I think there must be, then I'll say generally, well, yeah, I believe that. So, that aside, covenant theology as a system is not built on the covenants of the Bible. You know the covenants of the Bible. The, the, the covenants of the Bible would be like Genesis 12. Uh, that would be the Abrahamic covenant. Or, or back to the end of the flood, the Noahic covenant. Noahic covenant was a promise God made never to flood the earth like he did the first time. Abrahamic covenant in Genesis 12 is the promise that God will take a people. He promises blessing a people, a nation, and then blessing to all the peoples of the earth through Abraham and his seed. Uh, you know, the, the, the promise in 2 Samuel 7 is the Davidic covenant. That is the promise that that seed would come through David and his line, that there would be someone to sit on the throne of David forever and rule the nations. And then you have the new covenant. This is Deuteronomy 10 and 30, Jeremiah 31, Ezekiel 36 and 37. And it is God's promise to Israel that he will forgive their sins and give them hearts to believe the gospel and to obey him from the heart. Those are the covenants of the Bible. Uh, some people throw some other covenants in there, um, and, and there are some debated ones. But dispensationalists track the covenants of the Bible to see the unfolding redemptive plan of God, which all spring out of the Genesis 3.15 promise, which, all, which is that God would provide a, a descendant of the woman who would crush the head of the snake and bring God's people to him in, in the gospel. And all of that's predicated on the eternal decrees of God, which say that, that God has planned from before uh, time how everything will go, and he will draw all his people to himself by electing grace. Those are the covenants that dispensationalists believe in. They're the ones in the Bible. They're the ones that we go to passages and say, these are the covenants. We love the covenants. The covenants of covenant theology are not those covenants. The covenants of covenant theology are not Genesis 3.15, Genesis 12, uh, 2 Samuel 7, and Jeremiah 31. The covenants of covenant theology are the covenant of works, the covenant of redemption, and the covenant of grace. Those are theological constructs that reflect biblical truths, but are organized as a system which is one level removed from the Bible itself. By the covenant of redemption, covenant theologians mean uh, that God has covenanted intertrinitarian relationship-wise to save people. Covenant of works is the, is the declaration that God saves people by works. This is literally what the covenant of works is. Adam failed in the garden at the covenant of works. Jesus succeeded in the garden at the covenant of works. And anybody that believes the gospel gets the credit of Jesus succeeding at the covenant of works. So you are saved by works in covenant theology, the works of Jesus as your substitute. And then the covenant of grace is what happens right after the fall when Adam fails at the covenant of works, and everything in your Bible after Genesis 3 is the covenant of grace, which is the working out of the covenant of redemption in time, space, history, where God unfolds his redemptive plan, and that's the history of your Bible. So does that make sense? The three covenants of covenant theology are not the covenants of the Bible. Don't get confused. Uh, dispensationalists are the ones that read the covenants in the Bible and trace those as God's redemptive plan. The covenants of covenant theology are, are theological expressions of some things that I, I wouldn't necessarily quibble with. I, I just would rather follow the Bible's articulation of the redemptive plan. 
the other significant difference between covenantalism and dispensationalism, and again, labels are unhelpful because I'm going to broad brush something and nobody who's a covenant theologian would agree, yeah, that's what I believe because there are, you know, a bunch of different ways to, to frame this and think about it. Um, but many who subscribe to covenant theology as opposed to dispensationalism would tend to flatten out God's redemptive plan and the people of God to sort of one expression. So you'll, you'll read, for instance, Calvin's commentaries in Exodus 20 on the Ten Commandments, and he'll talk about the church, the church, the church, the church. Whereas we would say the church was birthed in Acts 2. The church is not the same thing as Israel. God has purposes and plans for ethnic Israel that transcend even our time and will come to fruition in the future. We believe that because God said it. Um, whereas there would be other theologians who would say, no, the church is the new Israel. Israel is just the church in the Old Testament. And there's really just sort of uh, one way to think about the people of God. So maybe we could spend the next however many weeks talking about the difference between systems. But covenant theology, dispensationalism um, are two different systems, frames of thinking about theology but fundamentally, they are two different systems of hermeneutics. How do we understand the Bible? Um, will, we, will we take uh, what the Bible says at face value, what we call a literal grammatical historical hermeneutic, and then allow the, the, the text of Scripture understood the way langu we believe language works to say what it says and come to its conclusions? Uh, some of my, uh, lots of my heroes are, are covenant theologians. I read covenant theologians, uh, godly men, faithful expositors, um, lovers of the gospel uh, who have gone to be with the Lord, um, and, and they're heroes of mine. Um, and, and, and many of those men have in print said, well, if you take these promises literally, you end up with a future for Israel or Israel different than the church. And so, fundamentally, the difference between the systems is a different way to approach the text of Scripture. How do we understand it? So, have you decided which one you are? Do, should we just take a vote right now? I'm just kidding. The, this, if, if people were to ask, what is Grace Bible Church? Is it, is it dispensational? I would say, what do you mean? Um, if somebody is saying, are you covenant or dispensational? I would still say, well, what do you mean by either of those? But, but I think I understand what you're asking. And we believe the church and Israel are separate. We believe a literal grammatical historical hermeneutic. We believe in a literal future history for ethnic Israel. Um, and we believe in one way of salvation. Um, we believe in God's unified uh, redemptive plan throughout history based on his eternal decrees. Um, we're Calvinistic in our soteriology. So it, it depends on who's asking you. I don't know who it belongs to. Behind Dan Melantine. Oh, it's a Melantine. How do you respond to someone who says they heard from God, seen God, or they felt like God told them to do something? How do I respond to them sarcastically or compassionately? Anyway. Uh, it's a good question. I hate to answer it in a vacuum because we're dealing with, with real people. Um, if it's someone I have a relationship with, if it's a friend, um, I want to take time to, to gently, compassionately challenge some of those things without undermining a love for God without undermining a belief in the miraculous or the supernatural element to life. We, we actually, we're, we're walking in a physical world, but the realities are metaphysical. I, I would not want to reduce somebody to a mechanical view of things, uh, a fleshly view of things. I wouldn't want to take away the supernatural. I certainly don't want to take away a view that God speaks, but what I want to direct them to is God has indicated that he speaks through his word. Um, you want to know what God said? Open your Bible. The Bible is where God speaks to us. Prayer is where we talk to God. 
somebody claims to have seen Christ or had a a physical interaction with Christ or a a personal manifestation of Christ, um, I'm going to be very skeptical on the inside and have a poker face on the outside. Tell me more. Um, You you actually saw him. Um, uh, (laughs) I I just would ask a lot of follow-up questions. Um, My goal in that is not to dismantle my friend's theology. That's not my ultimate goal. Um, I certainly want my friend to know the truth. Um, I I want my friend to have a confidence in the Bible. The Bible will eventually undo some of those things. Uh, The Bible rightly understood, keep reading. But I will will tell you what happened to me. Can I do that? Uh, I, I, I lived and talked fairly mystically, believing that God would talk to me, uh, believing in, in personal interactions outside of, of the Bible um, that were revelatory. By the way, if, if, if somebody believes God is giving new revelation today, it ought to be binding and it ought to always be true. Th- those are the biblical standards. Right? If, if somebody says, I got a word from the Lord, well, it, if it's about the future, it better come to pass. If it's about the past, it has to be absolutely accurate. God does not lie. He does not err. If somebody's claiming speech from the Lord, it has to rise to the standard of God's written word. And usually people will shy away from that standard. They'll say, well, no, I mean, it was just kind of an impression. Um, Yeah, that one didn't work out, but these other ones did. And so I believe, for me, it was a matter of feeling like a personal relationship that I could talk to God and he could talk to me back. And so my freshman year in college, uh, Nate Archer was running for freshman class vice president. Uh, Four people in front of him stood up and gave speeches, and they all said, God told me to be the vice president of the freshman class at Moody Bible Institute. God's leading me into leadership. Uh, It's God's will for my life that I be... Well, listen, there's only one vice president, and four people can't be told by God that they're going to be the vice president. Uh, Nate Archer picked up on the irony of that when probably no one else in the room did. We were just used to talking like that, like, yeah, God's talking to me and leading me and saying all this stuff to me, and we didn't really think about it. We didn't really think about the fact that God's not going to contradict himself. God's not going to tell one guy one thing, tell another guy another thing, and it's God talking. I think for humor's sake, Nate Archer picked up on it, and he got up and he gave a speech, and he said, In the fourth hour of my devotions, a light appeared in the corner of my room, and it got bigger and bigger and bigger, and it was Moses. And Moses said, Nate Archer, I want you to run for freshman class vice president. And who am I to go against Moses? I mean, I don't want the plagues of Egypt to fall down on Moody Bible Institute, do I? And as he's giving this speech, the dean of students comes and pulls Nate away from the microphone, ends his political campaign, whispers in his ear in front of all of us, Nate just smiles, waves, and walks off stage. And what struck me in that moment is the dean of students was offended that Nate would put words in the mouth of Moses, but nobody was offended that Nate put wor- that, that people were putting words in the mouth of Almighty God. Nate did not intend to dismantle by mysticism, but he did it in a moment. And I stopped talking like that that day. I just said, I, 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 can't, I can't speak for God when he hasn't spoken. Um, so... I would suggest that, that most people probably won't have one moment where they abandon what they feel is so personal in their relationship to God. It's hard to let go of. Um, for me, providentially, uh, Nate did that in a day, although um, I should have been reading my Bible better before that. So I don't know what to tell you in terms of your, your friend and that specific situation. You don't want to undermine supernatural things, but you do want to build up confidence in the written Word of God. Great question. Karina, you got a 90-second question? You've got the answers? Oh, it depends on my answer. Oh, okay. I defer. How was that? Uh, Let me see. Um, This is as a parent, and it's about friendship. And the question is, is it biblical to have a best friend? And the way, reason I'm asking is because sometimes I think it can be, there's an element of partiality to it. And so I guess my real question is, what, is it biblical and is it wise? I'm very partial to my best friend. 
She's sitting in the third row. You know what I mean. I don't I, it's, as Oh, as a parent, okay. Uh, yeah, can your kids have best friends? Um, so a little window into my relationship with my best friend. I have historically used the phrase best friend for probably like a thousand people. <laughs> and, uh, and, and Janet would say, no, that, that you can only have one best friend. What, what, why are you talking like that? No, he's my best friend. You haven't seen him in 20 years. He, he was at our wedding and we haven't seen him since. Well, yeah, but back then, he was the guy I was closest to. He was my bud. Um, so it all depends on how you mean it. Uh, I think there is wisdom in having caution about partiality with a superlative adjective. Um, we have taught our kids that their siblings are their best friends. Now, that's plural. Can you have plural besties? I think with siblings, you have to. You're connected forever to them. Uh, your loyalties are there, and so easily outside friendships can come in and want to sort of put wedges between siblings and siblings trying to impress the friend will ditch the other sibling and all that stuff. You, I think you have to be careful with that kind of thing. I, I, am, I am increasingly suspicious of cliquish attitudes that divide and, and if you notice that best friend language is having an adverse effect like that, um, maybe a change in the language can help. The biblical principles are no partiality. Um, it, is, it is pride that devastates friendships and breaks up relationships. Um, get rid of those things. Have capacities for love. Now, is it okay to spend more time with certain people have fond affections in varying degrees for different people in different circles. I think so. I think that's demonstrable in the Bible. I think just even looking at uh, Jesus articulating that, or, or John the Apostle uh, used the name that seems to have come from a, a close relationship to Jesus. He was the one whom Jesus loved. And, and you have the circles of Jesus, you have the Peter, James, and John circle, and then you have sort of outward working concentric circles amongst the 12. Um, those things are okay. God provides different relationships and different friendships. Um, but I think you're wise as a parent to pay attention to using phrases like best friend that indicate a selfishness, a lack of love, a partiality, a division. Doesn't mean they have to love everybody the same way all the time. Um, but it does mean watch for those attitudes that creep in. And the world teaches it. I, I think our, our flesh would tend toward cliques. Who do I want to be around that makes life easier, better for me, less problematic? Um, who, who, what relationships can I get more out of? There's selfishness in all of that. Um, I think if you have an open heart of love and you're ready to love everybody, um, it's probably a better starting point. That doesn't mean doesn't mean you should do what I did and call everybody your best friend. But it's a great question. All right, let me close this in prayer, and we'll be officially dismissed. Lord, thanks for tonight. Thanks for your wisdom from your word. Uh, we thank you for the church and your people who love you, who love one another. Um, we ask that you would help us, even as we go out of these doors, to think about a world around us that desperately needs the gospel. Uh, we'll enter eternity meeting your fury unless they have the righteousness of Christ. And so we pray to be ambassadors of that necessary, wonderful, glorious message, even as we go in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, you're dismissed. Have a great night.